Okay, well, we're going to have a look at Matthew chapter 5 from verse 20 uh, today. So let's just start with, with a word of prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you and ask for your special blessing as we seek to understand the essence of the teaching of the Lord Jesus. And Lord Jesus, we pray that you also will bless our teaching and you will bless our desire to understand you. Please, Lord Jesus and Heavenly Father, please be with us in our efforts to be spiritually minded and to really grasp the essence of what our Lord would have us be and how he would have us think and act. Please, Father, strengthen us in our weakness, and may your Spirit more fully fill us up so that we might be as you would have us be. We ask this, Father, for the sake of all that your Son was and is and ever shall be. Amen. Okay, so starting at Matthew 5, <clears throat> verse 20, I say to you that except your righteousness shall exceed or superabound over the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees you shall in no way enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well, they were, of course, the, the absolutely typical uh, righteous people externally doing all their tithing and all the uh, obedience to the law and so forth. And yet he says that your righteousness has got to super abound, has got to super exceed above that. We may think, well, that's just not possible. And I think this is an example of where the Lord throws out challenges to spirituality, which he knows are actually, humanly speaking, beyond us. And I guess the classic is really at the end of uh, Matthew 5, uh, where he says, Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now, we know that that's unattainable. But well, why then does he set up these challenges to ultimate righteousness, which apparently are beyond us? Well, I would suggest that the reason why he does this is to drive us to that sense and that realization that how can I be this righteous? I can't. He wants to drive us to that question because then we are forced to throw ourselves upon him and his gift and offer of righteousness in Christ. Now, of course, in Romans, uh, Paul puts this in so many words, that by being in Christ, we are counted as if we are Christ, and therefore his righteousness is counted to us. So then, in that sense, we are counted righteous. And yet, of course, Jesus was uh, saying these words before Paul had come out with all that. And I think that he's, he's paving the way for the, the good news that, that Paul pronounced that by being in Christ, we can be counted righteous. At this stage, I think the Lord is simply setting up the question. I want you to be as perfect as your Father in heaven. I want your righteousness to far exceed the legal righteousness of the, of the scribes and Pharisees. Now he says, unless you do that, you will in no way enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, the idea of entering in is quite common in the sermon. And it's clear that, in a sense, Jesus has the idea that we are entering now, and yet, ultimately, we shall enter in when he returns. Remember, he says in Matthew 23, verse 13, about those who are entering into the kingdom are hindered by the scribes and Pharisees. So then, it seems to me that... <clears throat> It's a case of now and yet not yet, that we really are in the process of entering into God's kingdom by responding to the Lord's teaching. We are in process. And this is a wonderful thing, that the future is not just a, an unknown. The future is not simply just unknown to us. How will the, the day of judgment work out? In in essence, we're actually making the answer now, that in essence, we actually are entering into that kingdom right now. Now, verse 21, <clears throat> you have heard that it was said by them of old time. Elsewhere, when Jesus is talking to the, the Jews, he says, don't you know that it is written? And yet, when he's talking to the poor and the illiterate people, he talks about, you have heard. That is, it's all oral um, that they, they've heard because they were illiterate. Now, literacy levels in, uh, in first century Palestine were only about 10% at the highest estimate, and some estimates are that it was only about 3%. Uh, 
Now, most of the literary, literate people in Palestine would have been the scribes or the, the wealthy. And yet it is to the poor that the gospel is preached. And as Paul says even to the Corinthians, not many mighty in this world have been chosen. And so the, the way he talks here, verse 21, verse 27, verse 33, you have heard, and then he gives his explanation. It just shows that to the poor the gospel is preached. It just shows that the intention of the Lord was to bring the desperately poor to him. And we need to just bear that in mind, that Christianity is designed, if you like, as a religion for the very poor. And we have to ask ourselves whether we actually are the very poor, and it seems to me that we are not. Uh, in, uh, in their first century Palestinian peasant terms. And yet this is a religion designed for the very poor. Okay, verse 21 and onwards, he starts talking about your relationships with your brother. Now, when we read about your brother in the Sermon on the Mount, we therefore ask, well, to whom was this addressed? Well, back at the beginning of chapter 5, we made the point <clears throat> that um, his disciples came unto him in verse 1, and he taught them, verse 2. So then he's talking to the disciples here. Now it's true that although initially the disciples alone were with him, it seems from the end of chapter 7 or the beginning of chapter 8 that actually great multitudes slowly came uh, and sat down there. But the, the thrust was his teaching to the disciples. And so he, I think, here has in view the idea of brothers uh, within the community of believers. And there's a lot of talk in the Sermon on the Mount about our relationship with our brethren, that is, those within the community of believers. In the context of the disciples, their relationships with each other. Now, what that means is that the Lord foresaw that difficulties between fellow believers would actually be significant, and I think he also foresaw that this actually is one of the most demanding, difficult, problematic areas in the life of those who would follow him, our relationship with our brethren. Very often people join the community of believers assuming that Ah, here I have found a, a church of, let's say, a hundred people who are all absolutely wonderful. And as it turns out that uh, over time that they, they see that that's not the case, many people, and I mean many, turn away because of their disillusion and because of their upset with the community of believers. And I think it's the shock of disappointment, of dashed expectation. That is always so difficult, isn't it? Uh, shattered expectation. And I think the, the large amount of teaching in the Sermon on the Mount about your brethren, forgiving, not judging, and so forth, I think that that really indicates that the Lord foresaw what a problem this was going to be. And also, I think, how our relationships with our brethren are intended by the Lord to be the vehicle through which he develops our spirituality. And that's my out-of-church Christianity. Uh, just not bothering with any association with others, other believers in any form, because there's always problems and so forth. Um, th that is missing, I think, his I essential uh, intention for each, for each of us. So he says, verse 21, that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment without a cause. Now the Greek is always elsewhere translated vainly to no reason. Now that would suggest that there is nothing wrong with anger in itself. Of course God himself is angry. Uh, but angry, uh, anger which is vain, which is not creative, this is what is wrong. Now the wrath of God in that sense, uh, as Emil Brunner observed, is the love of God. That the, the anger of God is not simply the anger of an offended deity. It is not in vain. It is to create something. Think of how 
in his wrath, God destroyed the world that then was at the time of the flood, and yet out of it he brought the salvation of the faithful into a new society. So what the Lord is saying then is that motive in anger is all important. Whoever is angry with his brother vainly, without a cause, without anything creative there, shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. And, but whosoever shall say, You fool, shall be in danger of, of Gehenna, that is, of final destruction. Now, Raka. Well, Raka was the sound made when a man cleared his throat to spit. And it was a term of abuse in early Semitic languages. So to despise your brother, to clear your throat and spit, as it were, uh, at him or on his name, uh, is to be seen as a very serious sin. And we wonder, if you call someone or feel about someone who is in Christ as a, a right idiot uh, uh, and so forth, and this is a pretty high standard. If you talk like that about those whom the Lord Jesus loves, and he loves those who irritate you and are your sworn enemies, uh, who slander you and the rest of it, he does. He still loves them if they're in Christ. If you speak of them as Raka, as Racha, you know, I despised that person. For me, they are not a person. We are in danger of the judgment. Then he goes on, and if you call him a fool, so you should be in danger of the, uh, of the council, but whosoever shall say you fool shall be in danger of hell fire, of Gehenna. Now that's the Greek word more, from where the word moron comes. But it's used in the, in the Septuagint, in the Old Testament twice, Psalm 78 verse 8 and Jeremiah 5.23 in the Septuagint, um, to mean a rebel, an apostate. And he's getting closer to what he's going to say in chapter 7, verse 1, that if you condemn your brother, you shall be condemned. Now, he's saying that if we then really are going to uh, treat our brother in this manner, uh, we are in danger of condemnation. Now, this terribly wrong idea, which has crept into a number of our uh, a number of our congregations of disfellowshipping people. This is a very evil practice. It's absolutely unwarranted. And if we in any way despise our brother and saying, you can come and break bread, that's, that's pretty bad. That's very abusive and leaves huge psychological and emotional damage upon the person you do that to. If you do that, then he says you are in danger of all these things. Now, when he says um, <clears throat> that uh, you should not uh, do these things because you will be in danger of uh, the council, you shall be in danger of uh, judgment of, of uh, Gehenna. Of course, the council would have been understood by them as really... Um, the, the Sanhedrin. But you didn't go to the Sanhedrin council just for saying uh, raka, or feeling raka, uh, about your, your brother. And the Lord is saying, no, you wouldn't do that in Judaism. But you will come before the court of heaven. The angelic court of heaven was an idea very clear, clearly entrenched in Judaism, uh, if you do those things. So I think this is his view of the Day of Judgment. I think he's saying that if you say these things to your brother, it will be raised at the Day of Judgment. And in some cases, if you said Raka, you will come before the angels, because the angels are going to be there with the Lord Jesus uh, ministering judgment. He doesn't come back to earth alone. He comes with the angels. And if you say you fall, if you condemn someone as an apostate, then you shall be in danger of of Gehenna, of destruction, the final condemnation. Now he keeps saying, in danger of. I wonder if the idea is that the structure of the Day of Judgment is such that we are intended to learn. To learn about others, to learn about our own misjudgments, our own sins, etc. And 
if we get the point, then we shall not be judged. We shall not come into final condemnation. But we shall certainly come into judgment in the sense of discussion of the issue, and in some cases uh, going before the angelic council, and in other cases you are in danger of Gehenna, of actual final condemnation. All because of our words in this life. Now, you understand why the Lord says uh, at the beginning there, uh, verse 22, uh, whosoever is angry or hates his brother without a cause is going to be in danger of all these things. And I think he has in mind there from the Septuagint of Leviticus 19, verses 16 to 18, which says this, You shall not go up and down as a gossip among your people. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall frankly rebuke your neighbor. You shall not avenge nor bear any grudge, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So he's saying then that, the law is saying then, Leviticus 19, that to go around as a gossip is to hate your brother in your heart. And instead he says, talk to your brother and rebuke him if you have an issue. So actually the command to rebuke your brother if you have an issue is really for your benefit. Because otherwise, if you don't frankly do that, you are going to be tempted very strongly to go around as a gossip about that person and you will end up hating your brother in your heart. And I think that's what the Lord is referring to here. So when he says, don't be angry with your brother, don't hate your brother, uh, I think that this is what he's, he's getting at, that passage in Leviticus. And there is quite a connection made, actually, in the Proverbs, Proverbs 26, 22, and also a passage in Ezekiel 22, verse 9, a connection between murder and gossip. Uh, it's as if gossip can cause social death, uh, and really it is the ultimate hatred of your brother to go around gossiping about him. And let's face it, we are very inclined to do that, and social networking has become such a, a thing, an endless being in touch with each other, communication, Twitter, tweets about this, tweets about that, Facebook, email, the whole thing. You know, this is a huge temptation to gossip. You realize that, don't you? And the more I think we get into it, the more tempting it is. So then every word, Jesus says in Matthew 12, 36, will be judged. And by our words we will be justified, and by our words we will be condemned. So this follows on from the, the basis that the Lord's laying here, that there is going to be a, a huge emphasis in the Day of Judgment upon our language, upon words. And in society as we, we know it, words are very cheap. You can say what you want and that's all right. As long as you don't do it. You can threaten somebody, yeah, but just, just don't do it. And certainly there's no criminality about thinking something uh, aggressive about your brother. And yet, actually, according to Bible teaching, according to the words of the Lord Jesus, our words are what's going to decide our eternal destiny. That's why James says in James 3, 5, and 6, and I think this is a, a commentary of his on the Sermon on the Mount, James is full of allusion back to the Sermon on the Mount, uh, that the tongue has the power to cast a man into hellfire, into Gehenna. And you may say, ah, but they were only words. You know, David committed all sorts of stuff and he's in the kingdom. Well, I only said it. No, the, this is the whole striking point of the Lord's teaching here, that by your words you shall be condemned. And when you actually look at the reasons that are given for the condemnation of so many pagan nations in the Old Testament. You would have expected idolatry and so forth to be the number one reason, but very often it is their words about Israel. In Daniel 7, 11 and 12, <clears throat> we're actually told that the beast of the last days is thrown into the fire of destruction, Gehenna if you like, uh, because of his words. Jude 15 that during the process of condemnation, uh, the wicked will be reminded of all their hard words and hard deeds. You said this on the 6th of June at uh, 3.44 uh, p.m. 
Uh, GMT, you said this. Yeah, that's, that's the implication, is it not? And yet we, we say our words and they, they slip through our fingers like sand and we, we, we don't really take them that seriously and we certainly can't remember them. But God is remembering them. Isaiah 65, verses 5 and 6, we're told that at the day of judgment, God is going to quote back some words to some in Judah. They had said, Stand by yourself, come not near me, for I am holier than you. And God comments, That is written before me. I will recompense. So, a standoffish attitude, saying, I'm holier than you, we can't have you at our table, God says he is going to remember that, and that that is written, that is engraven before him, and it will be recompensed. So you see the importance of our words, and the fact that our memory is such that we forget words. The vast majority, 99.99% of all the words you've ever said, you've forgotten that you said them. This is the, this is the difficulty. We tend to remember actions. Ah, yeah, well, I messed up, I did that, I shouldn't have done yeah, well, I was sorry about that. Yes, good, but what about your words? Now, this is inconvenient, isn't it, to, to hear this, but the Lord is setting this down as the essence of Christianity. We came to the Sermon on the Mount eager, eager beavers, eager to understand what the bottom line was of his message, and now we come up with this pretty high, tough standard about language and words, and we're like, whoo, wait a minute. Now, this is what he's saying. Now, he goes on in the context of relationships with brethren, verse 23. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go your way first, and first be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. What's the force of the word therefore in verse 23? Well, he's just been saying that if you're angry with your brother and you despise your brother, then you are in danger of condemnation. Therefore, therefore, if you have an issue with your brother, sort it out. Implication is because it's probably going to lead you to bad thinking and bad words about that brother. There is a myth, and this is mythical, uh, that time heals. That, well, I don't need to uh, deal with that issue for the moment, because, well, yeah, in time, uh, get over it, it'll sort itself out. Well, time does not heal. That, that is a myth. Time heals nothing. In fact, all it does is make things fester. And maybe on very petty things, uh, yes, but it doesn't heal. And that's a nonsense to say that time heals. There are two people who got divorced 10, 15 years ago, remarried other partners. Do you mean to tell me that time's going to heal that? No, it doesn't. That this is nonsense. Uh, time doesn't heal. And quite clearly he says that if you're taking your gift to the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you, then you are to run off and reconcile. In other words, don't think that all your other good deeds can reconcile, uh, can justify, as it were, your lack of reconciliation with someone else. Because it's that lack of reconciliation which ultimately leads to condemnation. Now for years I read this as meaning. That if I'm going to offer my gift at the altar, then I remember that I have got something against my brother. Well, I should go sort that out. But he doesn't say that. He puts it... It's just so demanding, isn't it? He puts it the other way round. And there you remember that your brother has something against you. You take the initiative. Even though you may have forgiven him. Even though, as far as you're concerned, that's passé, that's finished. If you remember that he has something against you, then you need to sort that out. That's a very, very, very high standard to call us to. But as I said, we came here to the Sermon on the Mount, all eager beavers to, to try to... Uh, uh, get the, the essence of the Lord's teaching, and, and this is it, isn't it? It's very, very demanding. So then we are to, to go to others and try to get them to deal with the issues which they have with us, even if, so far as we are concerned, 
it's all been sorted out. From our point of view, we're willing to play on, but if the other guy isn't, you need to sort it out with him. Now, of course, you're going to say, yeah, but he won't talk to me. Yes, I understand this. For my own life, I understand this. People refuse to, to talk. People refuse to have uh, any level of conversation. I have this with many of my mother's family. I have it with my wife's mother's family. Just for years, total refusal. We will not talk to you. We hate your guts, but we're not going to talk to you. And so, you know, you, you, you try to take the initiative, and how can you when somebody says, if you call me again, I'm going to call the police. <laughs> okay, you know. Um, how can one be guilty? One is not. Uh, of course, and, and Paul had this when he says in Romans 12, 18, as much as lies in you, live at peace with all men. So he's saying, yes, you take the initiative. That's what the Lord is saying. Uh, but Paul is sort of balancing that out by saying, well, as much as lies in you. And of course, Paul died totally unreconciled to, to huge numbers of brethren, all in Asia, turned away from him, and yet they were still with the Lord because the Lord wrote letters to some of them, and those in Sardis, for example, he commends uh, as walking with him and, uh, and so forth. Um, so it's not always possible, but the point is that we should take this extremely seriously. Now, he goes on, of course, in 25, agree with your adversary quickly. Well, who's your adversary? This is your brother who has something against you, 23 and 24. So he understands that within the community of believers you will have your adversary. Now, that is important because, as I say, so many people lose their, their faith, even, their commitment, because they have got the idea when they first convert that they're joining a community of wonderful people who all believe exactly as they do. And this is not the case. And when the reality dawns and somebody's mean to them or they see a load of fighting and argument amongst people who are in Christ, they get disillusioned and turn away when they shouldn't. And yeah, sure, that's their fault that they do that. They, you know, they are guilty. Uh, but I think that if they had started off with a more realistic picture of the community and a greater focus upon their personal relationship with their Lord, then maybe that problem would not have arisen. And so Jesus is setting out here in the Sermon on the Mount the fact that there will be adversaries amongst your own brethren. He says, agree with your adversary quickly, because, he seems to imply, you are on your way to judgment. It's as if the two of you are walking to the, to the judgment seat or to the, uh, to, to the court, to the courthouse. And you're almost on the courthouse steps. And he's saying, look, agree at any cost. Agree at any cost so that uh, this thing doesn't go further. Agree at any cost. Now, this idea that we are on our way to judgment is picked up really in 2 Peter 3, 11 and 12, where, again, he says you should, with urgency, watch what manner of people you are, because we are speeding towards judgment. The implication is that we are guilty. Because, see, in 25 and 26, you're on your way to, to judgment. You better get straight on the courthouse steps with your adversary, lest he delivers you to the judge, to the officer, and then you're thrown into prison, and you're not going to get out there till you've paid the uttermost farthing. The implication is that the, course, the, the case is going to go against you. And you know that from the start. Well, that may just be hyperbole, an exaggeration to make a point. And I think the point is that if you have an adversary, you must get right with him, because if you don't, you will be condemned. The case is going to go against you. So then, I suggest then that the hyperbole is to make that point. It doesn't mean that we are ultimately guilty. It is a hyperbole to make a point. That really we must try to get reconciled with our brethren. And so then, reconciliation must be a fundamental part of our lives. Reconciliation must be high on our agendas. 
And it is impossible, therefore, to just leave things. Some people turn to roll their eyes and say, oh, you know, Duncan's writing another email. Oh, he phoned me up again about all the old business. Yes, absolutely. It, it's not pleasant, is it? Who wants to keep on, you know, dragging up old things? You know, you won't fellowship us. Why not? Let's sort it out. And we tend to think, oh, we've been all around this before. You're not going to change old Bert. You're not going to change him. You're not going to change her, you know. Forget it. But look here, this is pretty serious. And you know why it's serious? It's serious for them. Even if in our hearts we have, we have scribbled it and say, look, mate, it's scribbled as far as I'm concerned. But the point is, even if you've done that, if they've got something against you, I think the implication of all this is they're speeding to condemnation. And you are the one who can actually save them out of that condemnation. Not that you're condemning them. Uh, but you can save them out of that by getting them to reconcile. That's why it's important. Even if people roll their eyes and say, are oh, you on about all this again? Well, yes, because the, the point of what the Lord is saying here is, if you are unreconciled to your brother, then you're going to be condemned. Now, as I say, Paul does have that, that rider that as much as lies in you, that there is this element uh, that does not depend upon us. But I think putting the two things together, the point is you must devote your life, your life to reconciliation. So when he says in 25, the AV says, lest at any time he does this, the, the idea in the Greek is definitely in case, in this case, he is going to do this. There's not a possibility about it. Now, I've been emphasizing this need for reconciliation, but as I say, um, the Lord Jesus recognized uh, the believers in Asia as walking with him. And yet, 2 Timothy 1.15, all they in Asia are turned away from me, Paul says. So, you know, Paul died with brethren turned away from him, and yet they're still ultimately going to be saved. Incidentally, that same word that you've got there in 2 Timothy 1.15, when he laments that all in Asia have turned away from him, is used in Acts 19.26 about how he persuaded those believers in Asia and turned them away from idols to serve the living God. So it was all very tragic. And uh, the way you know, life ends, unreconciled with so many of those with whom we hope to spend eternity, is very, very sad. I don't, I don't doubt this. But the point is that we must, so far as we can, continually and repeatedly take the initiative in seeking to reconcile if we know that our brother has got something against us. But just look at this for one moment from another viewpoint. He says, lest he, that is your adversary, that is 25, delivers you to the judge, officer, and then you're cast into prison. Your adversary, who the implication is, is your brother, from verse 23, it is someone within the ecclesia, they have the power to get you to judgment over certain things, if they want. And that's why, that's another reason why the Lord is saying, reconcile with those people. Because although they're wrong, if they, as it were, take you to judgment, uh, God's judgment, over different things, you are going to have to appear there. And I wonder if there is an element of that also that's in view here, that if you actually um, insist that, look here, you're going to have to answer for that, the Day of Judgment, in my spiritual immaturity, I unfortunately said that to brethren sometimes, um, <clears throat> you're going to have to answer for the Day of Judgment for what you've done. You know, actually, they will have to. It's far better for me to forgive them than I have done, and so I'm not demanding that anyone comes to judgment about anything. Um, but what happened if I hadn't? If I had stayed on that level of spiritual immaturity? Well, yeah, I was in the right, and they were in the wrong, and they were abusive. So then, yeah, well, they would have had to come to the Day of Judgment. And from their point of view, it would have been far better to come to me and say, Hey, Duncan, can we just uh, resolve that issue? But um, you know, they didn't, and they still don't. But uh, the point is, I've forgiven them. But if I choose not to do that, and if I were to uphold that position, you're going to come to the Day of Judgment and answer for this, 
Well, I think they will have to. But as we're going to see when we look at chapter 7, how we judge, the nature of our judgment of others is how we shall be judged ourselves. So if you don't want to have everything dragged up with you, well then don't tell other people that may you have to answer for this. Because actually, according to your attitude, they will have to. That's what I take from this verse here, that your adversary, your brother, can deliver you to the judge and so forth. But he doesn't have to, if you persuade him not to. And of course, the other reason why he doesn't have to do that is if he himself reaches a spiritual maturity of saying, I forgive you, forget it. Now there is, in verse 26, the slight implication that, okay, in this case, you will come out of prison after much suffering, losing family, etc., sitting there, uh, when you have paid the uttermost farthing. You could argue that, well, that was not possible, it's impossible for the poor guy to pay the uttermost farthing, so it just means he's going to stay in prison forever, it just means it's eternal condemnation. It, it could mean that. Or it could mean that you will come out from that when you've paid the last penny. And that would, in that case, that would then rather tie in to the idea that I have suggested that the Day of Judgment is a learning process. It is solely for our benefit. It is not that God himself needs to, as it were, uh, gather information. It's not that God himself needs to somehow uh, open the books and have a look and see what Johnny did uh, on the 6th of June 1999 at 4 in the afternoon in the suburb of South London or whatever. It's not, it's not that. God knows anyway. So then why is there the concept of a day of judgment? Well, as I've said, it is for our benefit and it is for our learning and not only for our personal learning but because the Day of Judgment in some sense will be public, it is for the education of each of us regarding others. Now, 27, uh, 28 uh, and onwards, seems to now go on to talk about uh, sexual sin. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in her heart. Well, his idea is that, look, it's a matter of the heart. And this is the theme throughout the Sermon on the Mount, that the, the emphasis is upon the heart and not upon the, the externalities. I think he had in mind here both Job and David. We'll start with Job. In Job 31 verse 1, he, when Job's accused falsely of uh, adultery, when his friends say, look, you're suffering so much, surely you committed adultery. He goes, no, I made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? And he goes on in verse 3, is not destruction to the wicked and a strange punishment to the workers of iniquity? He's saying, look, why would I even think upon a maid because there is a punishment to those who work iniquity. So Job clearly understood this. And it seems to me that the Lord didn't get his teaching just by flash revelation from heaven, but he'd worked out what he's saying here from the Old Testament. And I think uh, Job's words there in Job 31 are an example. Then, of course, you've got David. Bathsheba was very beautiful to look upon. It's the same phrase in the Septuagint to Samuel 11 verse 2. And, of course, David looks upon her, and then he, he commits the act. And so the Lord says here, whoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already. So he's saying, look, is not David going to be your example? If you look, then you shall do. He says in verse 28 that when a man does this, he has committed adultery with her already in his heart. And uh, the Greek for already is worth looking at. It really means even now. And I think that what the Lord is saying here is that 
every act of adultery is preceded by lust, by thinking about doing it, and then it happens. So that's the force, I think, of the word already. He's saying that every act of adultery was preceded by this, uh, th this lust. And that therefore, if you uh, look at someone uh, to lust after them, then you have already committed adultery. Why I say that is because there's a lot of angst by, by some, some brothers about this verse. Um, but you can't help but notice a pretty person, a, a pretty woman or, or whatever. That's quite normal. There's nothing, um, there's nothing wrong with that. The whole idea of to lust is literally, the Greek is to set the heart apart. This is talking about uh, something consciously done. It's not an involuntary uh, turning of the eyes. That is not what is in view here at all. And in fact, his whole uh, teaching about sexual misbehavior uh, continues in that same vein. Uh, because he, he goes on in verse 32 to say that whoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause or the logos, the logos, the internal thought of fornication, causes her to commit adultery. So that, verse 32, the idea of the, uh, the logos, the idea that is the germ of the action, um, that connects seamlessly with what he's just been saying here in our verse uh, 20, uh, 28, that whoever looks upon a woman, whoever lusts, um, whoever fixes their heart upon doing something like this, uh, will do it uh, because the, the action uh, was already done. Uh, the actual act of adultery was already done at first, uh, at first lust. I think that's what he's saying. And so the idea has been, in verse 31 and 32, that oh, yeah, there were two schools of thought. There was Shammai and Hillel. And, uh, uh, and uh, the Lord is sort of, you know, the argument was uh, that you could divorce for any reason. That's what the Hillel school was saying. You could just uh, give a divorce paper and divorce a woman for any reason. Whereas the uh, Shammai school were, were saying that, no, this was only if, uh, if there had been adultery there. And I don't think that Jesus is coming down on one side or the other. That's how, unfortunately, it's interpreted by a lot of interpreters who say, oh, yeah, Jesus is coming down on the side of the, the school of thought amongst the Jews that said that you could get divorced for adultery. Well, he might have been in a sense, but he, as always, is not just coming down on one side or repeating some simplistic position. He is giving a reason and is elevating the whole thing to a spiritual and a mental level. And so here on this issue, I think he's saying, yeah, whoever puts his way, uh, away his wife, unless for the logos or the logos, the, uh, the, the thought really, of fornication, causes her to commit adultery and so forth. So what he's saying is, again, that it is the thought of fornication of some sexual uncleanness which always goes before the actual divorce so yes he's uh, he's apparently saying that yes there is an acceptive clause that yes uh, you know he, he you should only divorce uh, in the case of fornication but the cause this is, I think, the point. He's alluding to this issue of acceptive clause or not acceptive clause. Uh, just in passing, uh, that's not the main thrust of his argument. The main thrust of his argument is that this would be for the cause, for the logos, for the, the inner thought of doing this, which led to the act. So then there's been some pretty hard stuff for us to take away with us today. Um, and as I say, we, we ran to this uh, chapter sort of all eager to, uh, to, to understand the essence of what the, what the Lord is getting at. And I think in these, um, well, ten or so verses that we've looked at, we've had some very, very tough things about thought, uh, about our attitudes to others, about the chronic need for reconciliation, 
and about the, the whole matter of the, the human heart. And that that is the essence of Christianity. It's what you're thinking about when no one's looking. It's what you're thinking about as you go to sleep at night, as you walk along a street, as you drive a car, as you whatever. Subconsciously, where your mind is. When I was baptized, I was drying myself off and I happened to open my Bible at random. And uh, I thought, yeah, well, maybe God will give me, give me a verse that's to guide me in my life. And yeah, I came to the verse that says in Proverbs, My son, give me your heart. Thank you. <laughs>